we appreciate Brad sharing all of those trials and tribulations and successes on the farm. Our next presenter presenter is going to talk about goats. And so Kenan or Ken Feaster, and I'm going to say it's probably Etchison based very on good. your email. Yes, very good. <laughs> is joining us from Nampa. And so I will go ahead and stop my share and let you share your screen, Ken. Sure, I'd love to. Um, give me one second. Um, okay, let me know if you can see. I can see it. It looks great. Okay, okay. so my name is Ken Feaster Etchison. Um, I have had uh, goats for over 40 years, started in 4-H at age 10 as a 4-H as a project. Um, heavily involved in the industry in my 20s, I managed a grade A goat dairy in Meridian, Meridian Heights um, back in the 1990s for a number of years. Um, my own personal show herd has ranged anywhere from 50 to 75 animals down to just, you know, under a dozen. Um, in the, in the registry, the American Dairy Goat Association, I'm currently a District 7 director, and I'm previous president of the association. I'm also a 4-H leader in the Valley and co-superintendent for the Youth Dairy Goat Division at the Western Idaho Fair. Um, in addition, I judge meat goats locally, judge dairy goats, pygmy goats, fainting goats, so I kind of have a broad knowledge of all types of goats. And this is meant as a very high overview, but if we have specific questions, I would definitely love to dive into that deeper. Um, with that being said, if I can get my screen to work. Okay, why goats? Obviously you're thinking about getting goats. Um, there's many different reasons. Um, perhaps milk and milk products. You wanna make soap, make your own lotion, provide cheese, kefir, ice cream, fluid milk for your own use or to sell. Perhaps you want to raise meat um, for, again, to butcher at home and use or to sell to others. Perhaps you're interested in raising breeding and show stock, um, sell some pet goats, maybe have a commercial herd, um, or just your own personal pleasure, you know, pet goats or just some barnyard pets to have on your farm. Um, maybe you're looking at an industry like fire and range management. And then there's other products that perhaps you're interested in as well, like selling hides or, or selling the fertilizer. Um, this is what makes goats so versatile um, on the homestead. So there's many different breeds and specific type of goats. Um, and based on what your ultimate goal is with raising them, will determine the type of goat you'd want on your farm. And we're gonna go into briefly into each of the main specific types of goats. So um, first of all would be dairy goats, the standard breeds. And there's nine recognized breeds of standard dairy goats. Standard means um, they're not a cross of a mini, they're a recognized dairy breed. Um, up in the upper right hand corner, the all white goat, that's called the Sonnen. This would be comparable to the Holstein in the cow world. They're one of the largest breeds of goats, the heaviest milk producers, but the least amount of butter fat. The goat in the center, the black and white goat, that is a sable. A sable is basically the same thing as a Sonnen, but they have color. So they're really the same breed. They can be the same size, produce the same amount of milk. Um, Sonnens are all white or cream. Any Sonnens that are colored are a sable but they are considered separate breeds. If we go to the upper right hand corner, this bay or brown and black doe, this is called an Oberhosley. Um, Oberhosleys, they were kind of developed in the 1980s. Um, they were actually registered with Alpines, and referred to as a Swiss Alpine prior to becoming separated out as an Oberhosley. Um, below that is probably the goats most people are familiar with, a Nubian. They're well known for their Roman noses and their floppy ears. They can be any color, combination of colors. Um, sables can be any color, combination of colors. Oberhosleys will always be that bay in black, or they can be solid black for does. Coming down to this bottom left corner, this is the newest breed of dairy goat that's been recognized. It's called a Guernsey. 
Um, they're developed off the Guernsey Island um, in the UK. They're really noted for their skin pigmentation, which is kind of a, a golden color skin tone. Um, they're typically a bay. They can be really a light, light color of red to a really deep red that I have shown in this photo. And they're also known for their long coats. Um, they don't have to have them. Some are naturally short coated, but many do have these long flowing coats. And actually, if you're showing them, they're shown in that full coat as well. They're not clipped down like the other standard breeds are. Moving on, um, the upper left-hand corner, this is called the La Mancha. They are pretty easy to distinguish with their lack of ear. They actually do have ears, they just have no outside visible ear carriage that you can see. Um, they were actually the only breed developed here in the United States back in the 70s, and that was developed by crossing a Spanish earless goat with the other breeds of dairy goats to develop the La Mancha that we see today. To the top right of that is an Alpine. Um, an Alpine is another Swiss breed of goat derived from Switzerland. They can be any color or combination of colors. The, um, also the La Mancha can be any color or combination of colors. Moving down to the bottom left, the, the chocolate or brown with white trim, that's called a Toggenberg. That's actually the oldest registered, recognized breed of dairy goat actually importing into the United States back in the 1800s. Um, they're a Swiss breed. They're one of the smaller breeds. They're not a miniature breed, but they're not typically not tall, rangy like you would see the Sonnens or the Alpines. Um, they're also known for their heavy milk production. Um, Toggenbergs, though, they can have an off-flavored milk. Um, the region in Switzerland where Toggenbergs were developed, they're known for a specific type of cheese, and they've actually developed Toggenbergs to produce milk with an off flavor because it helps produce that type of cheese. Um, you'll find some that have really wonderful milk and you'll find many that don't. So if you're looking for a goat for milk for your house, Toggenberg may not be that goat. Um, to the right of that is another one of our newer breeds recognized and that's a Nigerian dwarf. Um, they are a high butterfat breed. Out of all the breeds of dairy goats, you'll get your most butterfat. Um, amazing for making cheese, amazing for using for ice cream or butter. They don't produce a lot of milk because they are a miniature breed or a small breed. Um, they are no taller than 22 and a half inches at the withers or at the shoulders for does and 23 and a half inches for bucks. Um, they've really taken the dairy goat industry by storm. It's a small breed. People don't have to have livestock trailers and big acreages. They can have a small herd in many areas in their backyard even um, and produce milk for their family. Um, we're seeing a lot and a lot of Nigerians um, all, through, all throughout the United States are really a popular breed. Um, before we go on to that, um, pros and cons for dairy goats. Um, Pro is their dairy. If you want milk products, if you want to make cheese, to make lotion, to have ice cream, and you want to have all that fresh product for your house or for your family or to sell, that's the big plus in having a dairy goat. You can also butcher them, you know, butcher the males. You could provide meat for your family. That's an option as well. The con is with any dairy breed, you have to milk them. Um, dairy goats need milk twice a day while they're while they're in lactation. Um, they're, they're pretty um, easy to breed. Standard um, time for them to carry their kids is five months. Um, if you're milking year round, they do require a two month dry period. So they can have that last two months to really put that energy into their offspring and not into producing milk. Um, and we will move on. Next are mini breeds. Um, a miniature goat is a cross between any of the standard breeds crossed with the Nigerian. Uh, the first time they do that, they call it a first generation mini. Um, the idea behind them is to have a mid-sized productive dairy animal that takes less of a footprint, um, less feed, um, less space than the standardized counterpart. Um, we, I'm not listing all the breeds. Every breed that's in a the, the standard size, you can get a mini version of as well. Um, 
pros for mini breeds, they take less space. Um, you'll get more milk than you would just a Nigerian because they're crossed with Nigerians. You tend to have a little bit of higher butter fat. Um, again, you don't need to have a lot of huge livestock equipment as far as stock trailers. Um, they're easier to throw in the back of your pickup in a crate um, to, to transport that way. Negatives, um, not only with milking, um, the price range on mini breeds just really isn't up there with the dairy goats, with the standard goats. So if you're looking to raise show stock or breeding stock, you won't get the prices on the minis that you will for the, the other standard breeds of goats. Okay, moving on to meat goats. Um, there's different types of meat goats and we'll go into them. Boar goats, mitonic goats, mini silky goats, commercial mixes of goats. And believe it or not, pygmy goats. Pygmy goats are also a meat goat. Um, pros for meat goats. Obviously, if you want more meat. Um, difference between meat goats and dairy goats would be comparing like a Holstein to an Angus. Um, yes, you can eat a Holstein, but you're not going to get those really marbled steaks. You're not going to get that rate of gain. You're not going to get that muscling in a, in a Holstein that you would an Angus. Same thing with uh, meat goats and dairy goats. Dairy goats are flatter bone, they're more angular, they're more refined, they're, they're um, less muscled. You don't want to see that heaviness in the thighs, that width in that chest, um, that heaviness in the loin that you'll find in those meat goats. So if you're really looking for butcher animals, um, animals to provide meat for your family or to sell for meat, um, any of these meat goats would really be the direction to go. So in this, um, picture in the upper right hand corner is just uh, that would be a purebred um, boar goat that's a doe up on top and it's a buck down below boar goats are derived from Africa um, they really started coming into the country in the early 1990s um, price wise there's a big market for beak for boar goats um, a lot of people raise them and sell weathers for the 4-h market um, for 4-H kids to raise and sell at their stock sales. Um, a big meat market, especially with a lot of the different cultures that we have in the US. A lot of them are very familiar with meat, with goat meat and want goat meat. So there's a big market for that. It's a lot of that commercial side too, where you're not looking at purebred um, or if you're cared about registration papers. At the very top center is your pygmy goat, which most people are familiar with. And why they are a small goat, they are technically a meat goat. They have that same depth of body, that same thickness in the chest, that same muscling over the rump that you would see in a boar goat, just on a much smaller scale. Um, below that is a fainting goat, which again is classified as a meat goat. Um, they have a genetic um, mutation that causes their rear leg muscles to stiffen up when they're scared, and that's what causes them to faint. It's very temporary. Um, when they do it, they usually get right back up, kind of stumble for a little bit, but they're fine. Um, but again, another meat animal. Um, the very upper right-hand picture, the long-coated black and white goat, that is called a mini silky. Um, it's a smaller breed of meat goat. Um, they tend to be more of a pet market or a show market, but they are still classified as meat. You can butcher them. They do have quite a bit of muscling underneath that hair, um, but they're, there's a lot of shows where they just develop on having show stock. Um, one thing about the mini silky that's kind of interesting, their breed standard actually refers to the silky terrier dog and how the goat's supposed to look with its coat. Um, so definitely geared more towards a, a pet or a um, show stock animal. The bottom left or bottom right, the brown and white, that's a typical picture of a, of a commercial meat goat. A, could be a cross between boar goats and, and standard Nubians, you'll see a lot, or just non-registered meat goats where they're really not breeding pedigree. Um, they're not necessarily breeding for show traits, they're just trying to produce a lot of meat animals. Um, and there's still a lot of, again, a lot of need for meat animals being sold. Um, it's still a really big market, even at the commercial level. You don't quite get the prices at commercial that you do with registered boar goats, um, but if you're looking for some farm income, they're a good, a good animal to have. Um, nice thing about meat goats is you don't milk them. You know, they raise their kids, they dry off naturally when the kids are weaned, 
Um, they're not bred for heavy milk production, so you don't have as much hands-on. Um, a lot of meat goats just to tend to raise out in the pasture. You know, they're warm, they're vaccinated, but they don't have that daily attention that you have to have with a dairy goat. Um, so when you're evaluating the type of, type of goats you want, really look at time. You know, do you want to have to milk a goat twice a day, especially if you're working full time? Um, that can be quite, um, quite a devotion. Next, we have fiber goats. So fiber goats obviously are goats that are mainly used for their hair, their mohair, um, but they can also be eaten as well. The very um, upper left-hand corner is a, is a pagora, which is a pygmy um, angora cross. So you're looking at a smaller fiber goat. It takes less footprint, less, less feed, less room. Um, you still get a good quality mohair, maybe not as, as high quality as an angora would be. Um, but a lot of people like them because they're small and they're fun and they're cute. Um, below that is a nagora, which is a Nigerian angora cross. Um, again, you're not getting the quality of fleece, but it's much smaller scale, less to feed. Um, the center pictures are all your typical angora goats, what they'd be looking like. Um, they can come in white, they can come in browns, they can come in black. Um, you can see a lot of color variation in, in fleece. Um, again, angora goats, you don't have to milk them, so it's not as much labor. You do have to shear them, obviously, to get that mohair. Um, you, tend to have more problems with lice and things like that because the sun doesn't get to the skin, which can help you deter lice from, from staying on goats. So because that wool is there, there's more, you have to just really be careful and pay attention to make sure that you're not having a lice problem with your goats, especially with, with angoras. So with any type of goat that you have, um, it's important to really pay attention to your housing and your fencing. Goats are notorious for getting through fences um, and they're prey for um, coyotes, for lions, for domestic house dogs. Um, the, the, so you're, you need good fencing not only to protect your animals um, from getting out, but to keep predators from getting in. First, we'll have a look at housing. Um, I have some examples of goat housing you'll see. Um, housing should have adequate ventilation, yet be draft free and protect them from the elements. Some of these um, examples would be better in Idaho than others. Um, so for example, the top picture with the green roof, um, in the summer, that would be an amazing shelter because there's lots of shade, um, breeze can get in and out. Um, in the winter, you would have a lot of drifts getting into that. Um, it's not really protected from, from heavy rains if it's coming at an angle. So in Idaho, I would want to take half of that and kind of cover it up to block it. So there's a big entrance in and out and a real protected place back in the back. Um, the center top, is more of what you would see in Idaho. That would be more ideal if you don't have a huge big barn for animals to come into. Um, and again, the, the one below, very similar. It has lots of ventilation. You could lock them in at night if you have a predator problem. And a lot of people I know do that if they have a lot of mountain lions in the area, if they're up in the you know Northern Idaho or they have a heavy coyote problem, a lot of people do lock their goats in at night. Um, the upper right, just a little lean-to made from pellets. If you're in a dry area um, with not a lot of snow, <laughs> that would be ideal. Um, again, if you wanted to use pellets to make a little shelter, I would take some plywood and cover it in the winter so it's be able to be um, free of that draft going through. And then again, just another type of a shelter in the bottom right. Um, you know, a big barn is ideal if you have a barn, but if you're starting with a small acreage and you don't have the funds to put up a really nice expensive barn. These are nice affordable options. I've seen people use storm or storage sheds. Um, I've seen people use, you know, the, the pallets before. Um, you can build a nice little shelter fairly inexpensively if you're, if you um, are on a budget. 
Next is fencing. Fencing should be a minimum of five feet high. Um, suitable to keep the goats in and the predators out. Typical types of fencing you'll see is the welded wire, which is the one at the top with the poles, um, or the woven wire, sorry. You want woven and not welded. The difference is woven wire, the, the fencing wires weave or, or wrap around each other to make it more secure, or welded wire, they're just spot welded. The trouble is with welded wire, once the goats step on them, as you can see in the picture on the right, the welds will break, your fence will break, and the goats will go through. So something well or something woven is ideal, unless you're looking at a cattle panel, which is um, the one right below. Those are welded, but it's a lot stronger weld. Um, it also, it's a good standard fencing. It's easy to put up. You don't have to have a fence puller to make it tight. Um, most predators can't get through it, and most goats aren't going to be able to break through it either. Um, on the right-hand side with the boar goat standing up, that's actually called no-climb house horse fencing. Um, it's another really good fencing used. You could use it with or without wood um, supports. Um, main thing with, with a soft pliable fence like no-climb or like the, the woven wire at the top, make sure it's pulled really, really tight. You don't want your goats getting their head under it and then going under it or stepping on it and, and dropping it down. Um, I've even seen people use pallet fencing, which is what's here on the very, very left side. Um, and when I was growing up and we first got into goats, that was the pen that my dad used to keep their goats in as well. And it's just T-posts and pallets. It's a little easier for goats to climb over. Um, if the goats are jumpers, they, it tends not to be as high and some goats can jump out of it. Um, for miniature goats, Nigerian goats, it would be probably work pretty fine. Um, but again, the main reason is, main thing to think about is your fence needs to be secure. It needs to be tight. Because as I said, goats are notorious for getting out of fencing. So make sure that you have adequate fencing based on where your animals are, what kind of predators you have in your area. My preferred fencing has always been either the cattle panel or the no-climb horse fencing. And then I run hot wire on the inside of the fence, and that's to keep the goats from standing on it because I don't want them breaking it down. Um, I did live in Homedale for a while out against the bluffs, and I actually had hot wire running on the outside to help deter coyotes from trying to come in, and that worked pretty amazing. Um, so look at your condition. Um, look at what your predators are. Um, be aware of your own pets, too. Um, as I said, um, you know, dogs are predators. Even your personal dog, your family pet that you think would never have an issue, they're a natural predator and they do tend to go after goats. Um, once typically they've had a taste of goat, they never lose that. So fencing protects your, your pets as well as your livestock. Um, another thing of importance is feed and nutrition. A lot of people feel that goats can eat anything. Um, I think we've all heard, you know, goats eat tin cans. Um, technically, they eat the paper off the can because paper is made from trees and goats love trees, but they definitely have the reputation of being a garbage animal, which is really the furthest from the truth. Um, when you're looking to feed your goats, obviously hay is going to be your main, your main ration. Um, a mix of grass and alfalfa is ideal for goats. But a good quality, high protein alfalfa is preferred for goats that are milking or lactating. And ideally, second or third cutting hay is best compared to first cutting, which has a lot more noxious weeds in it. Um, first cutting hay, you'll tend to have cheatgrass, which is our national flower here in Idaho. Uh, you'll get abscesses formed in the mouth from those little barbs poking through. Um, it's really not ideal. So second or third cutting, um, even if you're raising meat goats, you know, alfalfa, is going to help with your rate of gain. It's going to give them the nutrition they need um, compared to a grass hay. Also pay attention that your hay is not too hot when it's baled, which will cause bloat. Um, hay that's not cured long enough in the field where there's still too much dampness in it, um, that can really cause a lot of bloating in goats and quick bloating where literally they can die within minutes. So when you're getting hay, if you're not familiar with the field that's come from or how the farmer puts up the hay, feed it cautiously, not too much at a time. 
Um, that way you you see how your goats are reacting to it. Um, also make sure you're not giving moldy or musty hay. Um, that can cause some toxic issues with goats. So if there's mold in your hay, um, you definitely don't want to give it to your to your goats. Hay should be fed um, in a manger or a feeder to avoid waste. Goats are notorious for jumping in their hay and pooping in their hay. And once they soil their hay, they're not going to eat it. And a lot of people getting into goats will realize, I'm wasting all this hay. The goats are standing on it, but they're not eating it. Well, it's not being fed properly where they have to stick their head in and eat it in a feeder. They're pulling it out, dropping it on the ground. And then once they defecate on it, it becomes bedding. They never, they're not going to eat it at that point. So the key is having a really good hay feeder. Um, so to avoid waste. Grains. Um, grain feeding can sometimes be a controversial topic among goat breeders. Um, some producers feed a lot of grain to the livestock based on the nutritional needs of the animal. Um, ideally, most nutrition is going to be coming from your hay. Most of your protein is coming from really good quality alfalfa. With that said, if you're feeding good alfalfa and, and nice, nice, nice quality alfalfa, grain is more of an extra. Um, it can help put the finish on a meat goat and it can help keep them busy on a dairy goat while they're on the milk stand and maybe help boost that production a little bit. But most of that, that um, diet is going to be coming from that good alfalfa. Um, when you're looking at grains, most commercial grains are a mixture of corn, oats, and barley. You'll hear the word cob or see the word cob. Um, you'll hear the term sweet feeds. A sweet feed is just a cob that they've added molasses to to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, molasses can also um, help keep mold down in, in feeds. So that's why you'll see a lot of feed stuff with molasses in it. Um, molasses does add weight to the bag. So when you're buying grain by the pound, if it's a sweet feed, you're actually getting less grain than you are if you're feeding a dry grain. Um, there's also commercial mixed, you know, um, with extra proteins, extra medications in it. Um, all kinds of goat feed on the market, um, depending on what you're raising, what kind of goats you're raising and what you're wanting from them would determine what kind of grain you want. Um, with dairy goats, we tend to look for a high protein grain. Um, with meat goats, you know, if you're trying to get them to show or to get them ready for butcher, you want more of a finishing grain. You're getting a lot high, more grain that, to a meat animal than you would be a dairy goat. Now we'll touch briefly on goat health. And we could spend hours talking about goat health. Um, the main thing to think about, if you're getting into goats, start with healthy animals, ask questions. It costs just as much to feed a healthy, well-bred animal as it does a diseased, sickly animal. It's gonna cost you just as much hay, just as much grain, um, it'll also cost you a lot more in vet bills and a lot more in your personal time. Um, avoid buying goats from the sale yard. Reason being goats sent to auction are typically sent there for a reason. A lot of diseased animals run through the auction house. Um, goats with open abscesses, goats with different, some of the different diseases we'll talk about. Um, the minute you walk through a sale yard and if you come home, you are risking tracking some of those diseases back to your farm. Um, when I, the few times I do take goats to the livestock auction, I actually um, take different shoes that I'm not going to wear back on my farm. I know people that wear booties. Um, just biohazard stockyards are not the place to be to dealing with, with livestock if you're bringing them back onto your property. One of the biggest diseases in goats is called um, CAE or Caprine Arthritis Encephalitis. Um, this is a virus that affects goats and not humans, so it's not zoonotic. They can't pass it to us. Um, goats pass CAE to each other via infected colostrum, milk, or blood-to-blood -blood contact. It's not passed through feces. It's not passed through breeding. It's not passed through sharing food and water. Um, there's a, not a lot of study on CAE because there's not a lot of money to be made from universities investing in goat diseases. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns with a lot of goat diseases, but some things with CAE that they've, they've found is um, it has a very short life outside the body. 
So if you have a, if you have a positive goat and it's been in a pen and you take it out of the pen and you put a negative goat in the pen, as long as there's no spilled milk freshly on the ground that they can put their nose in, there's no really chance of cross-contamination. Um, you can use the same brushes, you can use the same water hose, you're not gonna be transferring CAE if you're in the pen with them, walking to a pen with negative animals, not a lot of risk of transmission there. Um, if you do show goats and you're at fairs, I, I basically, when I, when I take my goats off the farm, I consider in my head, every other goat around me is now CAE positive and I'm gonna take those risks to consideration. So like when I'm at fair, if I have my milk stand at one end and my goats are penned down at the far end, I don't just let my goat loose to run to the milk stand because they could easily run over to someone else's tack area, stick their head in a bucket of milk that could be CA positive. Um, CAE is a lot of similarity to the HIV virus in humans. Um, blood to blood contact, so goats butting heads is one chance. Um, obviously through the milk, through that colostrum, not though through semen. There's no known cases of CE being contracted through live breeding. And there's no um, known cases of CE being passed through artificial insemination of positive animals. So unlike HIV, we're really not seeing a lot of exposure with semen just with that, basically the milk. CAE is also, even though you, you can't cure it in, the, in the, that generation, so if you have a doe who's positive, if you pull those kids at birth, you don't allow them to nurse, and you pasteurize milk, those kids will grow up negative and, can, and stay negative throughout their life. Um, so it's really getting that colostrum and getting that milk from their dam is what's spreading that CAE virus to the next generation. So a lot of people who have dairy goats do have a, maybe a CAE negative or CAE positive doe in the herd. They just never use that milk unless it's pasteurized and they don't allow kids to nurse on the dam. Um, these are some examples of CAE, things you can look for. Um, a big one is swollen knees. That knee joint will really swell. It could be on one knee, it could be on both knees. Um, second, is on that last picture is they can look emaciated, they kind of waste away. You'll see today a lot of asymptomatic CAE where goats test positive, but they show no signs. Um, back in the, when I started in goats back in the 80s, um, CE positive goats looked more like the animal on the right. At two and three years of age, they would be crippled and emaciated with arthritis and could barely walk and would have to be put down. So that's the, the extreme version that you still come across once in a while, but typically you're just gonna see some swollen knees, maybe some congestion in the mammary system that never goes away, um, or you may see no visible signs at all. Moving on, um, next is a disease called CL or caseous lymphadentitis. CL is a highly contagious disease in goats and sheep called by a bacterium called crony bacteria or cranibacterium um, pseudotuberculosis. Um, CL can be vaccinated for, you see this a lot in the meat goat industry, people are vaccinating for CL so their goats don't get it. Um, the, the negative on that is once they've been vaccinated for CL, they always test positive going forward. Um, why that might be a concern, if you're selling breeding stock to other breeders and they are concerned about CL, they're not gonna know if that animal's testing positive because it's been vaccinated or because it has active CL in its body, um, unless they trust you and really are comfortable with your management practice. Typical CL, you're gonna see um, lumps in the lymph glands, lumps at the base of the ear, lumps under the eyes. Um, the middle picture shows the red dots are where the various lumps will be for CL. And then the more graphic picture on the right is a ruptured CL abscess. It's that cream cheese, it might have a green, a green tint, um, thick pus in the abscess. Um, the CAE virus has a very long life outside of the body, very long. So if you have CL positive animals and the abscesses rupture 
and you have a wood barn and that virus gets into the wood grain, it can live there for quite a while. I mean, years. And then if another goat rubs against it and maybe there's a splinter and it pierces the skin, you're now spreading that CL. Um, it lives in the ground. Um, so it's kind of a big deal. I mean, I, if, me personally, as, a, as a, a goat breeder, if I had to pick which disease, I'd much rather deal with CAE than deal with CL. Um, they can also get internal abscesses, abscesses in the heart, abscesses in the lungs, abscesses in the mammary system. And when those rupture, um, depending where the, the, the abscess is, it will cause death in the animal. Um, or it'll spread, you know, get mastitis, that it'll spread to kids that are nursing on, the, on those does. Um, it's, it's kind of a nasty thing to deal with. Um, if you're butchering goats, you know, you'll see abscesses inside the animal as well, which will make the, brand, the, the meat not, as, not usable. Um, that's why you're seeing a lot of the meat goat people vaccinate for CL, so they don't have to deal with carcasses with abscesses. Lastly, I'm going to go over sore mouth. Sore mouth is a contagious um, eczema. I probably pronounced that incorrectly. Um, it's found in sheep and goats. It causes scabs or pus-filled sores that form around the goat's mouth, lips, face, ears, feet, scrotum, teats, or the vulva. Sore mouth is zoonotic, which means we can catch it from our goats. Um, so sore mouth is kind of a big deal also. The sore mouth scabs also live that the viruses and the scabs that fall off the mouth, that lives for quite a while outside the body and can be um, picked up later years down the road. Um, back in the early 2000s, my spouse and I bought some ground that we didn't realize 10 years earlier had been used as a feedlot and they had some sore mouth issues. And that first year on the farm, um, our goat kids picked up sore mouth just from being on that farm. That's that vacant for a good 10 years. So it really does live a long time. These are some a little more graphic pictures of sore mouth. Um, of the top picture around the lips is what you tend to see a lot. Um, then on the, the bottom picture is sore mouth on the, the end of an ear. Um, the center picture is under the tail and vulva. And the picture on the right is uh, a person's hand that has picked up the sore mouth virus from livestock. So if you are treating goats with sore mouth, um, basically you can't, it has to run its course. Um, you can cut some of the scabs off if it's becoming a problem, um, but it really, it'll, it'll cure itself. Once they've had it, goats tend to never get it again. They build up immunity to it, but any new animal you bring onto your farm is susceptible to come down with it. Um, if you're gonna be dealing with sore mouth, a lot of people will, will clean it, they'll bleach it, they'll put, you know, um, lots of like teat dip things, iodine based things on it to help with the symptoms, um, but wear gloves so you don't catch it yourself. It is quite painful from what I hear. And it's not something you really wanna get on your hand and spread to, to other people around you. So um, kind of a personal for me, oftentimes I deal with a lot of goat people um, from, all over the United States in, in my position in the American Dairy, Dairy Goat Association, from high scale producers to hobby breeders. And one thing you'll see is a lot of do-it-yourself veterinarians. Um, there's not a lot of vets that are knowledgeable in goats. So you tend to have a lot of word of mouth, people reaching out to experienced breeders or just kind of learning on your own. Um, and while learning to treat and diagnose health issues with, other, with others or help of a mentor, um, can be cost effective, nothing replaces the need for a skilled veterinarian. Um, I hear all the time from people, well, I can't afford to call a vet. Well, if you can't afford to call a vet, you really shouldn't be having livestock because you can't afford to have livestock. Um, last thing you can do that you don't want to do is search out on social media. And I see this all the time. You know, I'll log on to Facebook and someone will be panicking saying, my goat's been in labor and there's been a foot sticking out for two days. What do I do? Well, at that point, I'm sure the kid's dead. You know, if you would have gone to a vet when you first ran into an issue, you might have saved a, big, a lot of a headache. So find a good vet, have a good rapport, um, talk to, to people you purchase goat from, goats from to see what vets they're using, find a mentor, someone that you can, you know, run questions by. But 
don't um, underestimate the need of a good veterinarian. Because um, when you need them, you'll want them to be there. And with that being said, um, are there any questions? That's a lot of information and it's very high level. I, as I said, we could have spent probably an hour on any one of those subjects. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. Was a, that was a lot of great information and we appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is for somebody that's just starting out with goats and the person who asked the question did not specify whether they were looking for meat, dairy, or fiber, or a mix. Okay. Um, but what kind, gender, and number of goats would you recommend for somebody to start with? Okay, goats are a pack animal, a herd animal. So it's always best to get two. One goat by itself is going to scream because they want attention. They want a buddy. And if it's not another goat, they're going to want it to be you. Um, if, if you're a stay-at-home person or you have kids at home, and there's someone always there or you have other livestock, one goat might be fine, but I always recommend two goats. Um, you know, as far as male or female, you know, it, if you're gonna get a male and as I would, and it's gonna be a pet, if you're not gonna be using it for breeding, it should be weathered or castrated. Um, male goats stink. They urinate on themselves and that produce, then they have scent glands and that attracts female does um, when they're in heat. So having a buck that's not castrated, they're going to pee on themselves, they're going to pee on you, and that smell will be all over you, it'll be all over your steering wheel, it'll be all over your house. Um, it's not really a pleasant smell. Um, so a weather, a, a castrated goat isn't going to have that ob obnoxious smell. So if you're just getting goats and you want to try them out, and you're not sure about budget or even what direction you want to go, I would suggest a weather. Weathers are cheap. Most most producers, unless they're a meat goat breeder and they want to sell them for butcher, dairy goat weathers, people want them gone. They don't want to waste their time on raising them. There's really no money in them. So you can pick up weather goats, 50 bucks. I mean, from breeders that know that take care of their animals and are healthy. Um, so you're not investing a lot of money. If you decide you don't like them, you can butcher it. Or you can sell it to someone for a pack goat. I mean, there's things you can do with them. Um, if you think you want to breed, you know, getting a doe is a good idea. I would suggest holding off on a buck until you really know what you're looking for. Um, bucks need to be housed separately from does, um, so they're not constantly breeding them. Uh, bucks can breed at a young age. Does can breed at a young age. I've had does kid, um, well, I haven't had I've seen does have kitted like around seven, eight months. Typically, you want them to be a year or older, um, depending on their size. So bucks take a little bit of extra special fencing and things like that to make sure they're not getting into trouble. Does that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay so we just have about another minute. So I'm going to ask one more question. And this is, are some breeds easier to handle than other breeds? Um, no. And what it, what it comes down to handling is time. You know, if the more time you spend with goats, walking them, getting them used to, you know, being on a collar, being worked, the better they're going to be. With any goat, if you never touch it and it's in a field, and then once a year you're trying to bring it in to trim hooves and and handle it and give it shots, they're not gonna be bonded to you and they're not gonna be as easy to handle and work with. You tend to see that a lot with meat goats because a lot of them are pastured in the summer, they're just turned out to pasture and never touched. And they're brought in, well, you know, they're brought in for hoof trimming, they're brought in for warming. Meat goats tend to have horns, and they know how to use them. Um, so they're not as easy to work with. Um, unless they're a show animal and they've been handled a lot and let her in a ring a lot. So with any goat, I would suggest, you know, spend time with it. They're fun. They're a really neat animal. I mean, if you're going to have a small farm animal, it's like a big dog. I mean, that you can get milk from or butcher. <laughs> so they're kind of cool. That's great. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Okay. That, thank you for that presentation. And um that wealth of information. I'll remind everyone that we are recording these presentations and they'll be available on the student webpage. 
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and talk a little bit about what is coming forward for the next about hour and 15 minutes. So Ken Hart is going to briefly introduce an exercise about what else 